little amazed there's so many people here at <laughs> 4 o'clock in the afternoon. The other interesting thing, of course, is it's kind of ironic to have a physician talking about uh, dementia because physicians, although they're the first ones that are approached, they're usually the ones that uh, uh, don't have hardly any answers for the family. It's usually uh, other uh, caregiving uh, persons who can provide more of the support for the family. Usually, we're trying to change that, uh, especially educating our uh, residents and medical students in uh, the nursing home. We have a teaching nursing home rotation now for our residents. and and we're trying to change that equation, but the, the current physicians who've never had the opportunity to train are not quite as prepared as maybe some of you to deal with some of the practical management issues. So as I go through the talk today, if you have any comments or anything that I can learn about, uh, please don't hesitate to interrupt me and uh, let me know a little bit about what your thoughts or your experiences have been, and uh, hopefully we can uh, learn together here. Um, What I'd like to do today is, is kind of cover a little bit about the demographics. I don't know how much of this uh, Dr. McHuron went over, and uh, I don't want to beat a dead horse, so if you've heard this uh, before, please let me know and we'll move quickly through that. But uh, a little bit of the issues related to the demographics, why is this an important issue to be talking about, uh, a little bit of issues with regards to current concepts, mainly what are some of the theories with regards to dementia, what, are, what is the current uh, thinking with regards to the uh, epidemiology and etiology of dementia, as well as what are some of the differential uh, diagnoses that we consider in working up a patient with dementia. Um, I'll talk briefly about the evaluation, what uh, we tend to do as, as physicians to rule out some of the other uh, um, uh, diseases which may mask themselves and present as dementia. Uh, and then finally, uh, spend the balance of the time, and this is where I'll need some of your help. Uh, in terms of how do you approach, what are some of the practical aspects, what are some of the suggestions that are found in the literature in terms of the approach to patient and, and the family. Um, a um, geriatrician wouldn't be a good geriatrician without starting with the demographic pyramid. I think you've probably seen this ad nauseum in this, uh, in this course. But uh, the concept of the percent of the U.S. population that's growing uh, uh, in terms of age 65 and older it's important to look at that in, con in context with the risk uh, related to Alzheimer's disease uh, by age. And uh, it's important to note that less than 1% of uh, patients uh, will, uh, with Alzheimer's disease will present uh, under the age of 65 in contrast to uh, uh, about 20% of the population over the age of 80 uh, will at sometimes have some kind of dementing illness. So, uh, you can see that it's, there's a strong age association, and as the population ages, there's definitely going to be an increase. And in fact, uh, among geriatricians, this is going to probably be the next pandemic, uh, which will probably dwarf uh, the AIDS virus. So this is certainly something that we need to focus our attention on. Um, before I go any further, I'd like to just uh, cover briefly the, di the, uh, the definition of dementia. Uh, loss of intellectual ability of sufficient severity to interfere with social occupational functioning and of course memory impairment is a big component in that. Um, the criteria for the, the severity of dementia is broken down into various uh, areas which are relatively practical uh, to remember. Uh, the mild dementia where the work or social activities are impaired but the patient is still able to, uh, to maintain somewhat of an li independent living arrangement, uh, certainly with assistance but but uh, some capacity for independent living. Then moderate uh, independent li li living becomes more and more hazardous. Those of you who are out in the, in the real world uh, will know that, that uh, families will still tend to be supporting uh, patients with moderate uh, dementia, uh, even to the point of tremendous uh, caregiver burden. And then finally, severe dementia, which is really overwhelms the caregiving uh, abilities of, of, of most families, uh, so severe that uh, you need some kind of uh, institutionalization or some other kind of formalized uh, uh, long-term care services. Let's talk a little bit about current concepts, some of the uh, issues involved, what do we think uh, are the causes of, of Alzheimer's disease, uh, and we kind of break these down into categories as uh, definite or probable or very strong association as a risk factor, uh, some of the possible uh, uh, risk factors that have been mentioned in the literature, and then speculative uh, types of, of uh, of issues. Um, the the uh, first and foremost uh, um, risk factor, as I mentioned before, is age. And again, the association uh, that, that dramatically increases with the age of, of the patient. Interesting. That famous child I see yeah, that's some famous that's child. His 
with my grandmother, who uh, also happens to have uh, Alzheimer's disease. Um, but uh, the important thing with, in, in regards to age is that of interest is that there's some new data that indicates that maybe over age 85, the uh, risk of uh, Alzheimer's degree, uh, disease begins to decrease somewhat. And we're not clear on that, why that occurs, whether there's a survivor effect with those with, who uh, have a predisposition for Alzheimer's will develop or present itself before the age of 85, and that still needs to be uh, researched a little bit further. Uh, definite risk factors for dementia, real interesting uh, issue that looks into the area of Down syndrome. It's interesting to notice that, that uh, now that Down syndrome uh, patients are living past the age of 40, we're finding that uh, universally 100% of them will develop the classic uh, signs and symptoms of, of Alzheimer's disease. And, uh, and uh, when you look at it uh, at autopsy, it's a classic uh, uh, brain of Alzheimer's uh, patients. So. Um, there's uh, some issue related to, uh, to uh, a genetic link there. Um, <clears throat> they think that there may be a, uh, a mutation on, on gene 2021, 20, which may, uh, again, uh, predispose patients to the development of Alzheimer's disease. And uh, there's been some implication that there's a, a virus involved and that if the virus expresses itself right off the bat that you'll get Down syndrome and if the virus is latent somehow and is not expressed until uh, 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 later on that then that's expressed as Alzheimer's disease. So again, there's a lot of speculation in this area um, and um, this is caused, the 90s are being called uh, the decade of the gene and, and there's been a lot of work in this area, so it remains to see what uh, is involved there. One of the common questions I asked is, is this familial? Is this, is this uh, inherited? Is this something that I need to worry about? Um, it looks like about 50% of, um, of uh, Alzheimer's disease is, is inherited, and then 50% is what they call sporadic, which is, occurs um, without uh, relationship to uh, family, and, and uh, there is no genetic, uh, doesn't seem to be a familial or a family risk in, in 50%. So it's kind of a 50-50 mix. Um, I threw this, this uh, slide up here because uh, when you talk about the risk factors of, uh, regarding family, um, almost 90% of ethnic Germans in the upper Volga Valley of Russia uh, develop Alzheimer's disease. And again, a strong genetic predisposition in this group. We do see that sporadically in, in certain families. But uh, again, it's a 50-50 mix. Um, probable causes, uh, interesting, uh, but head trauma. Um, the, the first person, of course, that, that comes to mind is uh, Muhammad Ali, but he actually has more signs and symptoms related to Parkinson's. So um, it's not quite the classic uh, Alzheimer's type of model, but there is some suggestion that uh, even benign trauma early in life may, in fact, uh, trigger something which may be related to uh, the development of Alzheimer's disease. Again, we're into the probable area, so there's, there hasn't been the link there established as there has, has been with the other risk factors. Other possible uh, co uh, issues, uh, we've heard the aluminum theory uh, that uh, people cooking in aluminum pots were at uh, risk for the development of Alzheimer's disease, that there was aluminum disposition in the brains of patients at, at uh, autopsy with Alzheimer's disease. This is not beginning to pan out. Uh, uh, larger epidemiologic studies are, not in, are indicating that aluminum is probably not the risk factor that we thought uh, originally and probably in the next few years, I'll have to drop this from the slide altogether because it doesn't seem like that's going to really uh, uh, pan out to excuse the pun. But uh, <laughs> um, female, female gender, real interesting. Uh, as you know, um, uh, the predominance of, of older patients uh, over the age of 75, uh, 65, 75, 85, you get more and more uh, women as compared to men. The ratio is 61 to 100 over the age of, of 80. Uh, um, in 85. Um, but beyond that, there seems to be some link between uh, uh, being female. When you, when you balance that out in, in the studies, there seem, still seems to be a possible link between uh, uh, being uh, uh, female and having a risk for, for uh, Alzheimer's disease. And we're not clear, clear what that risk is or um, how that really interrelates in the whole concept of the global theories that we're trying to develop. And then, of course, the viruses, I mentioned that previously, uh, there are other viruses that have shown, uh, um, slow viruses that have shown, um, uh, we call them slow viruses because they, they present later in life, but there, there's some viruses that have been linked 
with uh, dementia-like uh, syndromes in, in, uh, in other dementias other than Alzheimer's disease. And there's some uh, question, of course, with the length of, of uh, this type of infectious agents. Um, a, possible, a possible link is uh, education. And it's, this is a really interesting area because we're actually going to probably have to move this up from possible to either probable or very strong risk. Um, the studies, uh, the original studies which were done in, in, uh, on mainland China uh, in the late 1980s uh, in a cohort of, of over 10,000 uh, uh, persons, uh, people going door to door and actually interviewing patients and doing the mini mental status examination and other examinations, seems to indicate that education is a strong risk factor for the development of uh, Alzheimer's disease. Uh, again, those, uh, those with high school education being somewhat more protected than those with, with no education at all. And you go on up the line where people with, with master's level having, uh, having a, a stronger, uh, um, uh, a less of a predisposition than, than those uh, with high school education, but yet having more predisposition than those with doctor's degrees. So real interesting. And in fact, we're beginning to try to unify that theory in looking at some of the mental status examinations, which Dr. McHuron may have mentioned and which you have before you. But uh, some of the original theories as to why those instruments were not uh, good in people without education were that perhaps there were, was a cultural bias with some of those or that there was an educational bias. Well, in fact, we may have been picking up patients who were really in the early stages of dementia and the form was actually more sensitive than we originally thought. So real interesting, this uh, area related to education. Um, speculative. Uh, there's been some data that indicates that hat size may be related to, to the development of Alzheimer's disease. Some really well, elegantly designed small studies that indicate that perhaps hat size may be related. How that really impacts and, I mean, are we going to go around measuring people's heads or not? I don't know. But um, interesting and worth mentioning, certainly, uh, for your, uh, for your uh, amusement, if nothing else. A little bit about the differential diagnosis. Uh, the other uh, major dementing illness is multi-infarct dementia. Um, and uh, Binswangers, which is another type of, of an infarcting kind of dementia, uh, the patients will get multiple small strokes, which may not actually show up as, uh, as uh, giving you the neurological signs of the classic larger strokes. But in fact, these strokes over time, these small little, little infarcts, result in memory decline, uh, usually uh, stepwise, there's usually a, a history of hypertension, especially in, with the regards to the Binswangers. And um, other than that, you will see a similar uh, type of uh, picture that you see with Alzheimer's disease. So um, this and Alzheimer's together account for um, uh, the majority of the, uh, of the dementing illnesses. And the other thing that's important to remember is you can get a mixed picture. You can get both multi-infarct dementia and Alzheimer's in the same patient, or Binswanger's disease and Alzheimer's in the same patient. Pick's disease, uh, clinically uh, almost indistinguishable from Alzheimer's disease. Um, it's a type of, uh, of problem that causes problems with the frontal lobes and the temporal lobes. Uh, uh, atrophy, they begin to, to kind of uh, dry up in the patients, and uh, the, the only real um, difference is the patients may have a greater degree of apathy. They may be misdiagnosed as being depressed when in fact they have Pick's disease, but other than that, it, the course is almost identical, and usually this diagnosis is made um, at autopsy. Uh, progressive supranuclear palsy, again, another neurological problem where the patients lose their ability to look upward, uh, conjugate gaze is what it's called, the inability to look up, upward, and again, a dementing kind of, of uh, a problem that we uh, need to, uh, to differentiate uh, uh, with. Other problems include uh, Parkinson's disease and, and uh, uh, late onset multiple sclerosis uh, and so on. Um, certainly those are part of our, our differential when we are working up patients, when we're looking at other causes of dementing illness. It's important to remember that Alzheimer's disease is pretty much a diagnosis of exclusion. We look at the other identifiable causes and if they're not present then we, uh, we say this is pretty much an Alzheimer's patient. Now, um, I threw this up there because it's really important to, to recognize that dementia is delirium until proven wrong. Uh, delirium is, can be due to multiple factors and one of the most common problems is of course medications in older people. I'm sure you've 
I heard this in other lectures here, the medications are a big problem. Uh, most patients, uh, uh, the primary job of a geriatrician, I think, is a detox doctor many times, and we wind up, uh, we take uh, patients off medications and their, uh, their mental status clears up. So, a big problem. Um, a lot of these are, are causes of, of uh, delirium or, as you see here with the mnemonic dementia, this is kind of the things we rule out. Uh, drugs being the major one, which I touched on. Uh, depression as being part of the emotional illness, metabolic, there's some metabolic disorders and endocrine disorders which can cause problems with, uh, with mental uh, uh, disorder, mental status problems. Eye, eye and ear, if people do not have their hearing aids in and their hard of hearing or they do not have their glasses and they can't see, then they're definitely going to have problems uh, understanding the environment around them and that can lead to problems with delirium uh, which may be misdiagnosis dementia. Uh, so the, the environmental factors are very important. Nutritional status, B12 deficiency being the one that comes uh, quickly to mind as, as being a problem that can present as dementia. Uh, other neurologic problems uh, can also be tumors, which is relatively infrequent, but uh, have to be part of what we think about. Uh, the trauma I mentioned previously, the infections I talked about, but also not only the slow viruses that I mentioned, but things as simple as a urinary tract infection, um, a um, a pneumonia can cause a different uh, difference in mental status in patients, and those really need to be thought of uh, most carefully because something as simple as a urinary tract infection that can be tre treated simply with an antibiotic can clear up somebody's mental status. And that may be the only presenting symptom in an older person, especially 80, 85 and older. They may come in with a change in mental status, and that may be it. Um, Alcoholism and, of course, anemia and uh, atherosclerosis or the multi-infarct dementia we talked about previously. Everybody get this down that wanted to? Okay. The evaluation of dementia. What do we do as, as uh, health care providers to, uh, to um, narrow in or focus in on the diagnosis? Um, history, impaired memory. Um, interesting to note that, that usually will be, uh, the patient may notice some of that, but most of the time we get the family member to bring the patient in and say, you know, we've really noticed a significant difference in the memory. Uh, usually, and I, I, I underline that, usually patients that come in and present on their own uh, will have what we call benign senescent forgetfulness. They'll forget a few simple phone numbers, maybe the distant friend's name, and may be really concerned about that. But that's, uh, that's not as, as, uh, as ominous as the family member bringing the patient in and saying, look, I mean, this has really changed. And the patient saying, yeah, well, I've lost a little bit of my memory, but I think I'm pretty functional. And that's kind of the classic uh, uh, presentation that I see in, in my office is pretty much the family really being concerned about the patient. Um, mood alterations, again, the patients will begin to pick up early that they are having some significant memory impairments and that could lead to uh, anxiety, to a lot of uh, frustration and uh, really can be, uh, again, uh, felt uh, directly by the family and the caregivers uh, the, uh, involved. And then impaired activities of daily living, patients are really uh, the instrumental activities of daily living especially. Uh, they've been used to taking care of the checkbook and all of a sudden they can't really do that or if they've been out and doing, used to doing the shopping I mean, they just can't really get those, those kind of tasks done that they used to do in the past. So um, again, this is kind of the, the presentation and some of the signs and, and areas that we look for. Uh, late findings, again, uh, the apathy, uh, irritability and uh, downright the, ag the agitation can be a, a late, late finding. Uh, some paranoia can be involved, um, uh, sleep disorders are not uncommon, and then finally you, you progress down the line to with the patient becoming incontinent and finally uh, aphasic, uh, unable to, to communicate at all. Physical exam really doesn't reveal anything. When we look at physical exam, we look for some of the other things that we mentioned on that whole list of the dementia, uh, eyes and ears and environment and kind of, of going down the line to see if we can find some cause for delirium. Uh, there really are no physical findings for uh, uh, dementia. 
I mean, for Alzheimer's disease, although late in the, in the disease, you can get some of these type of reflexes that we see uh, ironically in newborns that are newly born. These are some of what we call the primitive reflexes, the snout reflex, the jaw jerk, and, and the patients may have a degree of rigidity or myoclonus. And, but again, some of the reflexes that we see right at the, at the newborn, we begin to see in the late stages of Alzheimer's disease. Um, in terms of laboratory workup, again, all of these tests are designed to look at reversible causes, the delirium uh, areas that we talked about previously. Um, VDRL, which is to look for latent syphilis. Uh, a lot of patients may, throughout their life, have, have, may have picked up a case that was inadequately treated or not treated. And again, that can cause mental status changes, so that's something we look at. Thyroid function tests, hypothyroidism, again, mental status uh, uh, issues being focused in on that. Um, in selected cases, if people are on specific medications, we look at drug levels for those medications. Um, some patients, which you might suspect uh, an atypical kind of seizure disorder, you may want to order an EEG. Um, a lumbar puncture, again, for patients that you might infect, uh, suspect some kind of encephalitis or, or uh, infection there. And then heavy metal screen uh, for patients that may have been uh, heavily exposed through occupation or through other uh, causes. Um, assessment batteries, and, and uh, if you look at your handout, that's what I, I uh, had gave you a copy of the mini mental state examination, uh, and of course the geriatric depression scale, which is a, is a good scale to help to rule out depression, which is uh, uh, sometimes called pseudo-dementia. Um, and then another form, the short portable mental status questionnaire, so, and then the Hitchinski scale. The uh, advantages of these, the Hachinsky scale has to do with di differentiating between multi-infarct dementia and Alzheimer's disease. And uh, that is kind of a, um, a constellation of what we see in terms of signs of symptoms, and that has just been quantified so that you can use this simple instrument. Um, the short portable mental status questionnaire has uh, several advantages. Is it's very rapid, uh, it's, it's easy to administer, you can do that. Uh, anybody with just a quick training can go ahead and, and uh, know, learn how to administer this. It's rapid. You can test many patients uh, very, very quickly. The uh, downside for the mini sort portable mental status questionnaire is that it tests mainly memory, and then there are other factors that are involved um, in evaluating a patient for possible dementia, not just uh, uh, memory. And so. If a person, uh, there are some other cultural issues too, uh, President of the United States and, and other issues that maybe apply more here in San Antonio. So if people were not originally familiar with who the President was, there may be some issues with regards to how they would answer in those issues. Do you remember Dr. Lichtenstein used that on Andy? Mm -hmm. Same questions he used? Yeah. They had it in application. He showed them how to use it. Excellent. Excellent. Um, the mini mental status examination is, is helpful because it provides not only orientation and looking at memory, but also at areas of registration, attention and calculation, a very important area which will help you with depression because this area may be uh, preferentially, patients will score poorly on attention and calculation, uh, recall, and language. So this tends to the mini mental status examination tests more areas. It takes a little longer to administer, you know, up to five, five to eight minutes. And, uh, of course, all of these screening questionnaires need are not the end-all and be-all. If people score poorly on this, there may be other reasons other than dementia that they may be scoring poorly on it. So it just puts you in a ballpark or gives you a snapshot idea of what's going on with the patient at the time. <coughs> um, and, of course, the Hachinsky score, which I mentioned, and again, this is kind of a constellations of signs and symptoms that's just been quantified with a point value scale. Uh, but uh, things like uh, history of hypertension, history of strokes, evidence of uh, atherosclerosis, all of these are issues that relate to the, the predisposing people to having uh, strokes and, again, multi-infarct dementia. What did you say that one helps you differentiate? The Hachinsky scale, let me go back. The Hachinsky scale helps you differentiate between multi-infarct dementia and Alzheimer's disease. And the courses are a little different. Uh, they're both dementing illnesses, uh, but you can have more of a stepwise deterioration in the, in the multi-infarct dementia, so people will have plateaus where they'll function real well and have a kind of a stepwise deterioration where all of a sudden they'll drop down lower and then keep going for a while. 
where uh, Alzheimer's is more of a, st of a sloping kind of illness where it will be a directly kind of a downhill type of focus. Um, any other questions on the Hachinsky? I'm sorry, did you? Okay. Treatment. Focusing in on uh, treatment and uh, issues related to the, to the family. Again, we'll talk about some supportive interventions and pharma pharmacologic interventions. I really don't like to stress the pharmacologic interventions because those are really not the key in, uh, to the, uh, the uh, a good management for an Alzheimer's patient. So it can be used in, in support of specific areas, but the real focus is the supportive interventions. And I'm sure all of you probably have some some specific ideas with regards to um, some support. Good general health care, um, adequate nutrition is extremely important, adequate hydration, making sure that they have enough to eat and enough to drink and are, are um, up on that is extremely important. Physical activity is extremely important. People need to be able to, to as much as possible, get some kind of physical activity, maybe get outside if they can, and, and uh, keep some kind of physical activity regimen. And then adequate rest is extremely important. <clears throat> the more you text uh, an Alzheimer's patient, the more confused they get. And if you can, again, regularize, uh, regularize things, um, focus in on giving adequate rest, adequate nutrition, adequate hydration, and adequate physical activity, which is good advice for any of us to begin with, but especially with Alzheimer's patients, uh, extremely important. Active treatment of other ailments, I can't uh, overemphasize that. Um, back to the urinary tract infection of an, of an Alzheimer's patient has a urinary tract infection. They may get more compu confused above and beyond where they usually are at. And with an antibiotic, you, uh, the proper treatment, these patients could clear up and actually improve their mental status from where they were before. So there has to be an active treatment of ongoing um, uh, medical problems in these patients. Um, need to work with the family and need to work with the other uh, health care providers. Uh, usually it comes from the other way. Usually uh, the, uh, the other health care providers, the caregivers, are usually talking to the physicians and trying to engage them to help out in, in the care of these patients. Um, familiar routines. Um, really uh, recommend that you don't rearrange the furniture in their house every week. Uh, they need to have familiar routines, get up at the same time, have their meals at the same time. Everything should be in, in the same place. Um, consistent repetition can decrease agitation even in the, in the moderate, uh, pay, uh, moderate uh, stages of dementia. Um, it, if uh, you're taking them to the, to the physician, constant consistent repetition uh, two or three days prior to the visit will decrease that um, change in the familiar routine will decrease the agitation associated with that. Yes, ma'am. I just wanted to go back to the active treatment of, like you said, the urinary tract infection. There's a lot of the literature that talks about you see Well, if you're talking, you're talking about asymptomatic bacteriuria, which is um, has to do with in having bacteria in the urine, uh, but in the absence of white cells. In other words, in the absence of any kind of, of uh, inflammatory reaction on the part of the body. Um, the rule of thumb in the Alzheimer's patients is if there is a, had been a significant change associated, even whether whether you have white cells or not, if there's a significant change in mental status, then that would be considered to be a change where you would want to consider treatment. Uh, paradoxically, though, the majority of Alzheimer's patients are in pretty good health. In fact, most of them are in excellent health. And uh, usually you see that asymptomatic bacteria with patients who have multiple systemic kind of problems, diabetes, hypertension, other kind of, of uh, medical problems. Any other signs and symptoms, you would not necessarily If you're talking about a general rule of thumb in terms of... Well, the current, the, the current understanding is that with asymptomatic bacteria, you would not treat, but in this situation, if the patient has a significant change in mental status, then that has to be considered to be an infection, and it should be uh, at least considered to be treatment. And of course, that d depends on the uh, individual patient, but that's certainly an area that uh, 
It's interesting because uh, the literature is still coming in on that. Uh, most of the original studies were done in nursing home populations, and there's very, been very few community-based studies. So we're not clear how that's all going to pan out, but uh, currently that's an interesting area. Of, of, did I cover everything on there? Of course, the consistent environment I mentioned. Uh, um, Building self-esteem is important, uh, especially in the early stages where the patients are undergoing a lot of anxiety, a lot of depression. Uh, they know that there's something wrong. They're not quite sure what's going on. They may have been given the diagnosis. And so trying to fit them in in some kind of productive roles or keep them involved is extremely important uh, in the early stages. Um, need a family-centered approach. Uh, the family members are usually going to be the primary caregivers, so they need to be involved early on in the uh, process. They need to be uh, given some idea or some sense of what the course of the disease is going to be like, uh, what they can expect. Um, there's a wonderful book out, which most of you are familiar with, The 36-Hour Day, which gives a really good overview of, um, of uh, what to expect in the later stages. And I found that when I usually give that to, to the family members, uh, that uh, the stress level tends to decrease somewhat because they have a better idea of what they're up against. Uh, uh, so certainly the more information that's disseminated, the better. And um, if they have questions that I can't answer, I usually refer them to somebody or, or whatever. I think it's important for people to get all of their questions answered initially and to everybody to be on the same team moving in the same direction. Um, this also assists in promoting both the patient and the family's uh, security and, and of course uh, the family being on board realizing that the patients may have some difficulty in terms of leaving the stove on, in terms of leaving the front door open, in terms of perhaps having some wandering behavior, all of those things and involving the family early, letting them know that they, they need to keep an additional uh, uh, eye on the, on the patient is all important and it can help certainly in uh, promoting security for both the family and the patient. Um, early on and even in the moderate stages, if, you, if uh, the caregivers can focus in on those areas of abilities that patients begin to lose, uh, i.e., for example, the, the checkbook issues, if somebody can roll in there and fill in those gaps and begin to help the, the uh, patient early on, that helps decrease their stress level, may help decrease the risk of depression, and certainly, again, promote, uh, uh, increase the self-esteem of the Alzheimer's patient. Um, very important to take a positive attitude uh, with this disease. A lot of times people uh, look at this as a, as, a, as a terminal illness for which nothing can be done. And I really tend to emphasize the, the value of the, the uh, caregivers and of the community resources that are available and of the people that are out there that are really caring and really uh, um, um, there and willing to serve and you know getting down to the point of celebrating the remaining capacity spending those times when the patients are in the early stages of Alzheimer's and even in the moderate stages enjoying each other I think that's really important not to lose that and all the hustle and bustle of what we're going to do next to uh, make sure that they enjoy each other that they're capable to to um, in, in so much in so much as that is possible that people enjoy each other and that family members um, be, to, be together if they can. Uh, specific medications for specific problems, uh, anxiety disorders, uh, there's uh, the benzodiazepines, which is a group of medications uh, that um, can help, again, with uh, anxiety and, uh, and some difficulty sleeping. We, I tend not to use, use these medications very rarely. Um, I find it to be uh, um, uh, really not necessary. You can many times substitute things like a nightlight, soft music in the background at home. Uh, if somebody's coming into the hospital, bringing some familiar objects from home can all decrease the anxiety level. And I tend to use the non-pharmacologic means uh, first. And if you really need to, these are available as a last resort, but in my experience I've used these very, very rarely. Um, depression. Depression is a, is a tremendous problem, especially early on. Uh, people have gotten the diagnosis, uh, they can really at risk for getting a major depression. And um, all these medication groups are, are, um, are helpful in decreasing, uh, in, in treating the, d the depression. And then uh, electroshock therapy has been uh, given a bad 
publicity over the years, but in the elderly we're beginning to find more and more that it's an extremely effective treatment technique and it actually has less side effects than some of these medications. So that's certainly something that uh, I would consider in my patients, especially with some severe uh, bouts of depression. Um, insomnia, again, some of the uh, other medications I mentioned previously, and then chloral hydrate, which is an old medication, but uh, the old things seem to always work the best. And so when worse comes to worse, if you need to, I usually uh, tend to prescribe something like chloral hydrate again. You know, just getting the family involved and working with them, I really find that pharmacologically it's very, very, very uh, rare that I really need to use uh, medications. Agitation, that does occur, and it occurs, uh, it's the disease progresses, it sometimes occurs to the point where it may uh, actually precipitate the family uh, considering institutionaliz institutionalization perhaps earlier than than is necessary. So in those situations, we tend to use something like uh, Haldol to again decrease the agitation somewhat. That works quite well. We use, I use microscopic uh, dosages, uh, almost homeopathic dosages. And they, they just a little bit, just touching the patient with a little bit of Haldol sometimes will decrease the agitation significantly. It's important though that, you, that at least from our standpoint, we advise the family of the side effects. Uh, tardive dyskinesia, which is a, a type of shake that patients get, is, is not uncommon. Uh, with this medication, these types of medications, and that is an irreversible side effect, and so people need to be informed as to that possibly occurring before these medications are given. Um, medications that are currently being used for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease and experimental therapies. I did want to touch on these. The currently, the only medication on the market that is approved by the <coughs> FDA is hydrogen. Um, the major side effect being nausea, there's almost no other major side effects. Um, in uh, double-blind placebo studies, there has, has been a mild effect in early Alzheimer's disease. It is not a cure by any stretch of the imagination. In my experience, I usually uh, inform the family and the patient of this, and those patients who have elected to take this medication about 80 percent, 85 percent will see no change in my experience and maybe five to ten percent might uh, see some improvement or some slowing down of the disease. So it's certainly not a panacea, it's been on the market. The major advantage of course is the relatively low side effects and uh, once you inform people if they choose to, to embark on this, a lot of people don't and I don't have a problem with that. The one that's been getting a lot of play in the, in the press lately is uh, Tacrine or THA, which is a medication that is set to be released probably this summer um, under the brand name Cognex. Um, Cognex has, uh, again, they've, they've done extensive studies over the last three to four years. It is probably going to fall in the category uh, of the hydrogen with the exception that it um, has some significant side effects or some significant problems with liver toxicity. These patients need to be monitored carefully. And um, there's, a, there's a question as to whether this is really a, a gonna be a, uh, any improvement over we, what we have already on the market. But uh, nonetheless, in the spirit of, of uh, what's going on currently with AIDS medications, the FDA, I think, has decided that this should be released and that people should have the opportunity since, since Alzheimer's has, a, has a, you know, a pretty uniform course, that people should at least be offered the opportunity to, to uh, utilize this medication and if it works for some people, fine. Uh, nimodipine and some of the other uh, types of uh, antihypertensive medicines are still under study and are still investigational. Um, doesn't seem like we have a cure on, on the immediate horizon, but there are some medications that are currently uh, under trial, which may slow the downward course of the disease and might give you more uh, months of, of no decline. So uh, we may have something to offer in the near future. Explaining, I'd like to kind of wind up by talk, uh, kind of covering some of the things we talked about or originally. Explaining Alzheimer's to the family, of course, it's important to give the diagnosis, uh, to discuss what we talked about, the significance of the family history. Educate, uh, important for them to have access to the books, to uh, plug them into the Alzheimer's Association early in on the course of the disease and other sources that may be available in the community, like in San Antonio, there's Grace Place and other uh, uh, 
um, other associated kind of, of services. Uh, again, support groups, uh, Alzheimer's Association, other caregiver groups, need to, really important to plug in the caregivers, the primary caregivers early into these systems. Um, respite care, a real key important area that needs to be talked about early and often with the caregivers because they don't recognize that they're under stress many times and they may have significant burden and they just won't see it because they're so involved in the caregiving uh, function. So again, respite, extremely important in daycare in the same mold. If people can get a break, they can last longer. And family members, as you know, really want to take care of their relatives at home as long as possible. So these things help to delay institutionalization. Um, emphasize, again, uh, health maintenance for the caregiver. Um, increased risks of, um, uh, the studies that are coming out show increased risks of, of, uh, of med multiple medical problems, of depression as well. So again, the caregiver uh, many times, especially in the moderate to the late uh, course of the disease, actually become the patient. And uh, emphasize preservation of skills, as I mentioned, uh, prevention of premature dependency, um, and then not all features will intensify over time. And you need to kind of give that information. Anticipatory planning, um, didn't want to talk about this early on. There needs to be some plan for financials and how the finances are going to be handled within the family. Anticipating home care and of course placement needs. Uh, if the disease uh, follows its, its uh, ultimate course, there will be at some point along the line the, the overwhelming of the caregiver resources at home and placement needs to be talked about and usually the physician needs to give the caregivers permission if you want to put that in quotes, permission to, to not have that tremendous caregiver burden and there has to be a time uh, when you assist the family in making that transition. Um, guardianship, durable power of attorney, healthcare proxy, all extremely important issues uh, in talking initially, especially when the patient is in the mild stages and can still participate in, in uh, arriving at some of these decisions. Advanced directives are important, intensity of treatment, and resuscitation issues are all issues that need to be discussed uh, early and open and often uh, with these uh, family members. So I think I'll stop uh, at this time and then kind of open up the floor if you have any comments. Um, I always uh, enjoy uh, hearing your own experiences uh, in this area or if you have any questions, um, I'll just open it up now. Yes, ma'am. I have a geriatric side inpatient unit and it's almost impossible for us to send patients for MRIs and EEGs when they're demented. They simply just won't cooperate. You know, can't expect them to follow directions, lie still, whatever. And I think a lot of times physicians don't understand. I, and I'm not sure what needs to be done. There needs to be done something because there's a tremendous amount of waste of time and money involved in trying to go back and forth and get these tests done with people not understanding that this person simply can't do it. You know, right. It's very frustrating to us. I know. It's tremendously frustrating, and, and I know uh, the test results are 